All right, so welcome to boot camp. So I want to address a question first before I really dig into some other content. Question about dietary planning for patients with COPD and dietary planning for patients with CDA, because those are two topics that you will encounter, right? So let's talk about the COPD patient first. Somebody with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they are going to always have a difficult time breathing. COPD, the big issue is they can get the air in, but they can't get the air out. And so, you know, the thing with them is that they're usually malnourished simply because, can you breathe? I turn off your camera. Please turn off your camera. So you can't breathe and swallow at the same time, right? And so if I have a respiratory rate that is 30, it looks like this. <sighs> I'm short of breath. Can I eat, swallow, chew? Can't do it. So they are typically malnourished, okay? And the big problem is, you know, what do you do to get them to get sufficient nourishment? Make sure everybody's cameras are off and you're muted, please, thanks. So to make sure they get sufficient nourishment, um, what you have to do is with COPD ears, you want to get the most bang for your buck. High calorie, high protein, small frequent meals. And by the way, small frequent meals, that's the answer to life. Turn your cameras off. I'm recording. So small frequent meals that are high protein and high calorie. You want to get as much bang for your buck as you can get for these patients because they're going to have a drink of a protein shake and they may drink two or three ounces and go, I'm full. They can't breathe. You know, it's very, very difficult. Okay. So small frequent meals, high protein, high calorie. Now a student asked me about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates you need. Carbohydrates are necessary in order for your cells to make energy, okay? So, and this is something when we talk about endocrine that we've talked about, right? They, your, your cells need carbs, sugars, in order to you know, make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? Energy. So you would never eliminate carbs. You know, that's another reason why that keto diet is a bad idea. You, you need carbohydrates. So somebody with COP, COPD, high protein, high calorie, small frequent meals, small portions, right? You want them to drink after they've had something to eat. So if you're gonna give them say a half of a sandwich, because that may be all they're gonna be able to eat, right? You give them the drink after they've eaten. And I hate to compare it to, you know, like with children, if you give them their soda with their dinner, they're gonna drink the soda and then they're gonna go and fall, right? Same principle, but not for the same reasons. So they will get full fast because of the breathing issues. So drinks after they have eaten, not with their meals, okay? And when it comes to things that are temperature hot versus temperature cold, anything that is warm or hot dilates, okay? Think about it. Heat dilates. So if I'm drinking, say, a cup of hot chocolate, when that hot liquid enters my mouth and goes down my throat, it's gonna dilate everything, which for somebody with COPD could be difficult for them because if it's a, even a little bit swollen, they may have trouble. So cold, like a nice protein milkshake is a great idea because you're getting the calories, the protein, and it's cold and it's more of a liquid than it is a solid, which is easier for them to get in. So that's the thing with COPD, all right? with stroke, cerebrovascular accident. When someone has a stroke, remember a stroke is not a neurological event. A stroke is a vascular event. What's happening is somewhere in the brain, there is an ischemic area. In other words, there's an artery that's clogged with a blood clot, or there's an artery that has so much plaque built up in it that the blood can't get through. So there's a portion of the brain that actually is damaged or dead because of lack of blood flow. So it's a vascular event that causes neurological problems because depending on where in the brain 
that occurred, whatever part of the body that part of the brain controls, you're going to have problems with. So for people that have what we call massive CVAs, in other words, an area of the brain, um, let's say left hemisphere, okay? And the left hemisphere, speech, being able to speak, understanding speech, Broca's areas there. there. There are lots of areas on that left hemisphere that control a lot of things. And remember this, left side of the brain, the wires cross at the back of the neck. So left hemispheric stroke, right-sided deficits. So you can see a patient with right hemiplegia, hemi meaning half, in other words, they've got weakness on the right side of their body, or left or right hemiparesis. Hemiparesis is actual paralysis, so they can't move the right side of their body, okay? And when you think about the swallowing, in order for somebody to swallow, you have to forcibly swallow. And the epiglottis, which is kind of like a little trap door that's down at the base of the throat, the epiglottis needs to be closed so that nothing goes down the trachea and into the lung. So when you're swallowing, the epiglottis should be closed so that when you swallow, it goes down and into the esophagus and into your stomach. Everybody's had that thing where, you know, oh, it went down the wrong pipe and I choked. What happened was maybe you were laughing or talking or something while you were eating or drinking and the epiglottis just didn't close the way it was supposed to. And that food or drink, instead of going down into your esophagus, went down your trachea and you, <coughs> and you choked, right? People that have had a CVA will have neurological deficits that include a problem with the epiglottis being able to open and close the way it's supposed to. So they're going to have dysphagia, D-Y-S-P-H-A-G-I-A, -A, dysphagia, which means difficulty with swallowing. So when you are feeding somebody, number one, only a nurse should be feeding a patient with dysphagia. That is not something that you can delegate to an aide. Suction should always be nearby because in the event that they should aspirate, you wanna be able to suction them if necessary, okay? You always wanna make sure the patient does a chin tuck. So when they take a drink or they put something in food, you put food in their mouth, as soon as they're ready to swallow, chin tuck. Reason is that positionally, when I put my head down to my chest, I am forcing my epiglottis into a closed position. I'm not going to choke. All right. So you instruct them to do a chin tuck and, you know, they may need honey thickened or nectar thickened liquids. They cannot drink thin liquids because they're more likely to aspirate on thin liquids. That's where you would need a speech language pathologist, right? Speech therapist to come in and do that evaluation. And they make the determination about what type of diet that patient would be appropriate and safe to have. So, but it's usually honey or nectar thickened. So there's a packet of this powdered stuff that you put into a drink to get it thick. And it's actually called thicket, right? So this way they're less likely to aspirate. Um, the food is typically a pureed diet, right? Which means that we've taken the food and just put it into a blender and turned it into like, it looks like baby food, right? Not very appealing, sadly, but it's got to be. And if they've had a left hemispheric stroke, all right, remember, the wires are crossed at the base of the skull. So they're going to have a left droop, right, possibly. When you're feeding them, you feed them slowly, just one teaspoon, and you put it into the unaffected side of their mouth. So if they have a left droop, don't put the food on the left side. You put it on the right side. And I know this is super specific, but you're going to see questions about this kind of stuff. So make sure that you remember that. Okay. So, and you would consult speech therapy, but as the nurse, you are a licensed professional. It is expected that you are able to manage this, right? To be able to deal with, you know, feeding them. Um, whenever there's a CBA, you're going to get a speech, you know, evaluation. No doctor would ever refuse a script for that. 
but just know that, you know, until you're certain that there isn't a problem, you are not going to just arbitrarily give them here, you want to drink a water, right? Because you don't want them to aspirate. You know, one of the biggest issues I would have with clinicals, you know, you're, you're going down the hall in a facility and you have a patient sitting there, resident going, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. You don't know that resident. You don't know what their conditions are. And I watch an aide bring them and just hand them some water. And it's like, you know, are we sure that they're able to drink that? Right. Because what can happen is if they drink or eat and they aspirate, which means that that liquid or that food goes into the trachea and into one of the lungs, and it's typically the right lung, okay, that will embed in that lung and cause aspiration pneumonia. So it, it be, turns into a bacterial pneumonia because of that foreign body in the lung, okay? So that's really the best I can tell you when it comes to, you know, feeding people with COPD and feeding people that have had a CVA with any dysphagia. There will be nutritional questions on the boards, right? There won't be a ton. The boards are actually a little more straightforward than ATI. So you pass that predictor. Those of you that are from my previous classes, you're going to pass your boards unless you do something to sabotage yourself, like keep doing your ATI, make sure that you're you know, doing a little bit every day, okay? Because everything is in here. So nutritional questions, make sure that you know what food sources are good for potassium. And just remember the word potassium. P stands for potato. O stands for orange. T stands for tomato. A stands for avocado. And that's a cheat sheet that I've given all of you. And I'll put it up again so that everyone has it to remember those things, okay? Vitamin K, which is not potassium. And this happens a lot. Vitamin K, is a fat soluble vitamin that is stored in the liver that has to do with the body's ability to clot, right? Blood clotting. Vitamin K also is the antidote for warfarin, okay? So vitamin K containing foods, the green leafy vegetables, they're the big ones. Kale, quinoa, spinach, broccoli, okay? They have a lot of vitamin K. Potassium is an electrolyte that's represented by a K with a plus sign after it, okay? So don't confuse you know, those two things. Vitamin K and potassium are two completely different things. They're going to possibly ask about vitamin A, you know, which beta carotene and vitamin A are found, especially in things like uh, carrots. Um, please make sure that you are all muted. I'm recording, thanks. Um, things like carrots. And vitamin A is great for vision, okay? So that's important to know. Um, the B vitamins are very important for formation of red blood cells. So you've got B3, um, you've got B6, you've got B12. So you, you need to know where do you find the B vitamins and folic acid, okay? Um, citrus fruits, and I've got a cheat sheet for that. Vitamin C also. Vitamin C is great for the absorption of ferrous sulfate, iron, right? Vitamin C is also good for your immune response. All the B vitamins and vitamin C are water soluble vitamins. So your body does not store them, what your body will excrete if you have too much of them. Please make sure all your cameras are off. Thank you. Um, so the B vitamin C vitamins, um, you may get asked about fiber. Fiber is cellulose. So fiber is something that doesn't get digested. It basically just travels through the digestive system, but on its way down, it grabs a hold of water and it holds onto water. So it goes into your bowel and holding onto that water, it keeps the stool a little bit softer. So it makes it easier for people to go. Sources of fiber, one of the best sources are fruits with skins on them, peaches, pears, prunes, apples, right? Great sources of fiber. Um, nutrition is a big part of what we do as nurses. Sodium restriction, right? Reading labels, teaching patients what they should not be taking in. People that are CHF patients or hypertensive patients, 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day, right? And believe me, you start reading labels, you will find 
All condiments, for example, are loaded with sodium. Ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise. Nope, can't have it. And so they're gonna say, well, what can I have? Guess what? Pepper, black pepper, lemon, right? Those are great alternatives. Um, Mrs. Dash is an herbal salt substitute. Be careful because the other salt substitutes, most of them that look like salt, taste like salt, they're potassium. And people with CHF are probably on either ACE inhibitors, their algorithms for congestive heart failure. You can't give them anything with that much potassium. So they can't have those over-the-counter salt substitutes. Mrs. Dash is fine, but not the salt substitutes, right? So again, nutrition is a big part of what we do. Calcium, I'm gonna ask you a question about calcium. Where do you find it? Calcium fortified foods like oatmeal and cereal. Calcium's found in dairy products like yogurt, right? Milk, those kinds of things. Um, you need to know about celiac disease, which is a gluten intolerance. Gluten is found in wheat, rye, and barley. So that patient cannot have anything made with those things which includes even white bread because wheat is what they use to make flour and flour is what they use to make bread, right? So it's got to be gluten-free. They can have corn and they can have rice. So rice cakes are a great snack. Anything with corn or that's made with corn meal is okay. No gluten, right? So diet is a big deal. Think about cystic fibrosis, for example. Anybody that has cystic fibrosis, when people think about that, they think about the breathing issues. And yes, there are thick, tenacious secretions with cystic fibrosis that make it difficult to breathe. But there's also a problem with the pancreas. And the pancreas, you all know, is an endocrine and exocrine gland. So as an endocrine gland, the pancreas makes insulin and glucagon, right? Which you need to maintain sugar, right? But the pancreas also makes amylase and lipase. And amylase and lipase are two enzymes that are needed for the metabolism or breaking down of foods that are starches and foods that, are, that have fat, lipids, right? So people with cystic fibrosis don't have pancreatic enzymes. Their pancreas doesn't make them. And so you would give them pancrelipase. And pancrelipase comes in a capsule and you have to open up the capsule and sprinkle it over their meal, each meal. So every three meals a day, you open a capsule, sprinkle it on their meals. That's a predictor question, right? That content and the board may ask about that. How do you know the pancreolipase is working? Well, if it's working, they're going to have normal bowel movements because without it, they're going to have steatorrhea. So their bowel movements are gonna be diarrhea, that's basically fat. That's just fat and starch is just going through their body. They can't metabolize it. And so steatorrhea is diarrhea that the fat has just moved right through. It smells and it floats on top of the water in the toilet, right? So pancrelipase, you need to know about that drug in relationship to diet. Talked about sodium restrictions. I think we've covered um, maybe not everything, but a lot, right? So I'm gonna pause the recording and see if the students uh, have any questions about anything. And two, three, one. All right, let's talk about pharmacology because that seems to be a bone of contention with many people. So the first thing that I'm gonna go over are the medications that you need to know with regard to here we go. Medications that you need to know with regard to antidotes, and there aren't a whole lot of them. So I just want to make sure that you all know the ones that you need to know. Okay. And this cheat sheet I have put up, so everybody should have it. I'll put it up again, or I'll email it if you need it. When it comes to antidotes, acetaminophen and acetylcysteine. And if you look at it, acetaminophen, acetylcysteine, kind of sounds like it. Digoxin, which by the way is also called lenoxin, digibind. And that's kind of easy to remember because it sounds alike. Magnesium sulfate, calcium gluconate is the antidote. 
excuse me, heparin, protamine sulfate is the antidote. <clears throat> excuse me, warfarin, vitamin K is the antidote. And I've also put in here the other name. So warfarin is the generic name. It could be cuminin, it could be janivin. And vitamin K is phytonadium, okay? For the benzos, alprazolam, diazepam, lorazepam, pam, pam, pam. If you overdose on them, flumazenil is the antidote. Opioids, and I actually tried to list all the opioids here so that you are familiar at least with the names of them. Heroin, codeine, morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, meperidine, which is Demerol, Dilaudid. The antidote for them is naloxone, which is Narcan. Those are the must know antidotes. You will get asked about them. And the Board of Nursing loves to give you a question along the lines, you know, your patient's got um, an INR of 5.2, uh, the Theron warfarin. What do you anticipate the doctor will order? And they're going to give you as possible answers, protamine sulfate and vitamin K, and then two others. So you need to make sure that you know that that would be the vitamin K that they would get. Okay. So now drug levels that you need to know. To me, this is kind of easy because they're either 0 0.8 to 1.2 or 10 to 20. The only oddball is carbamazepine at five to 10. Digoxin and lithium are 0 0.8 to 1.2. Theophylline, phenytoin and banco are 10 to 20. Carbamazepine is five to 10. These meds listed here, you will get asked about them. And I promise you that you will get asked about DIG. I cross my heart, hope to die. Okay, you will. The Board of Nursing loves digoxin. They love it. I'm gonna ask about it. Remember this, that all these meds, dig, lithium, carbamazepine, theophylline, phenytoin, and banco, signs of toxicity, early signs, all look the same, okay? It's always a GI upset, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, right? My stomach's bothering me, ah, I feel nauseous, right? They all start out like that, but then, depending on what the drug is for, the signs start to go in different directions, okay? So with digoxin, digoxin slows the heart rate down. Well, if you're toxic, it can slow it down too much. Severe bradycardia is the sign of later toxicity. Dysrhythmias, again, it affects the heart rate, right? So it can affect them in the wrong way. Blurred vision, and then green or yellow halos around objects in the visual fields. People will say, I see yellow rings around things, you know, ditch toxic. Lithium, phenytoin, carbamazepine. So lithium is, it's unclassified. It's usually grouped with the antidepressants, but it's really not a true antidepressant. It's used for bipolar that's non-responsive to other meds. And it's used for mania. People that are manic, lithium works pretty well. Phenytoin and carbamazepine are anti-convulsants, anti-seizure meds. All three of them are neuromeds. Neuromeds, neurosymptoms. Flirt speech, they talk like they're drunk, right? People will mistake toxicity for, oh, were you out there drinking? You shouldn't have been drinking, you're on Medicaid. And it's not that they were drinking, it's that they're going toxic, right? Ataxia, which is, you know, involuntary and awkward movements, right? Ataxic gait is a shuffling gait like people with Parkinson's have. Dyskinesias. Kinesiology is the study of movement. Kinesia is movement. So DYS in front of anything means like dysfunctional family. Dyskinesia is movements that aren't right. So dyskinesias covers a whole bunch of things. Weird, awkward, involuntary, you know, large tremors of the upper and lower extremities, right? If we don't notice the signs and we don't do anything about it, they can wind up having seizures, coma, and then and, and dying. And remember, when it comes to risk factors for toxicity, and this is important, when you think lithium, you think salt. Just remember that. When you think lithium, you think salt because hyponatremia is a big, huge risk factor for lithium toxicity. So that is the time when you have a patient on lithium where you're gonna tell them, eat all the salt you want. You'll never hear me say that to anybody except a patient on lithium. 
all the salt that you want because if their sodium levels drop, the body will look at it like lithium is sodium and it will hang on to all the lithium and it won't excrete it and they'll go toxic. Digoxin, potassium, queen mother. Hypokalemia is a risk factor for dig toxicity. So if you have a patient that's on say a thiazide diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothaladone or furosemide or bumetanide loop diuretics, those medications deplete potassium. You wanna make sure that they're getting enough potassium in their diet because if they're on one of those and ditch and their potassium levels drop, they're gonna go toxic, okay? Vancomycin, antibiotic, high serum levels can lead to severe and almost instantaneous nephrotoxicity. Remember this, the mycins, all of them, nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity. Tobramycin, genomycin, vancomycin, all the mycins can cause it. But if vanco levels are elevated, they, their kidneys can go, we quit, shut down. Theophylline is a medication. It's an old school medication that's used for asthma. Um, aminophilin is the mother of theophylline, right? They're basically the same drug. And with increased theophylline levels, hypokalemia, it can cause hypokalemia, severe abdominal pain. Patient can go into metabolic acidosis, even seizures and death if their levels are too high of theophylline, okay? So you wanna make sure that you understand those toxic risks and those levels, okay? That's important. So make sure that you know them. I'm gonna pause because I see some chat boxes in there, like people were trying to ask me something. So pause recording, share my screen. And the diuretics are gonna be first. So diuretics, lovingly known as water pills, that's what non-nursing people call them, right? Um, what are they for? They are to reduce edema. That's their job. So if somebody is retaining fluid in the body, whether it's because of heart failure, because with heart failure, right-sided heart failure, they're going to retain fluid in their body. Left-sided heart failure, they're going to have pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs. Corticosteroids and estrogens long-term can cause fluid retention. And cirrhosis of the liver can cause abdominal ascites, which is fluid retention. All of those diseases can cause excess fluid that's accumulated in the body, right? Here are the meds that you have to know. There are three subclassifications with diuretics. There are either loop diuretics, potassium sparing, or thiazides. Loop diuretics, you got furosemide and bumetanide. They get rid of your potassium. They're potassium depleting, right? And that Lasix can cause ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, and it's got a sulfa base. So if the patient's allergic to sulfa, no Lasix for them. That's what you need to know about those loop diuretics. That's really it, okay? And remember, ototoxicity, damage to the hearing, nephrotoxicity damage to the kidneys. Ototoxicity, the manifestations of that, the first one is tinnitus. If the patient hears a ringing or a buzzing in their ear, they stop the drug and call the doctor because if they lose any hearing related to taking that medication, then it's permanent. They're not going to get their hearing back. Nephrotoxicity, manifestations of that. You tell them if they notice that they're not urinating the way they normally do, or the urine seems more concentrated, dark, stop the drug, call the doctor. Because if we damage their kidneys, it could be permanent also. Okay, so those are the loop diuretics, okay? And they're potassium depleting, okay? Potassium sparing, there's only one, spironolactone. And spironolactone's biggest issue, because it's potassium sparing, it can cause hyperkalemia. So remember, if it's low or if it's high, potassium is the queen mother. And because it's the queen mother, you're going to address that before anything else. That is your nursing priority. High or low potassium, you think potassium, you think muscle. And your myocardium is a muscle. High or low potassium, you're going to have dysrhythmias and possibly a heart attack. 
So you're gonna make sure that you get that patient on an EKG and you call the doctor, all right? And by the way, if their potassium is high, there is something we can give them to bring their potassium down. And it's called K-exalate. That's the way to remember it, right? K-exalate sucks out potassium. So if somebody has been taking spironolactone and maybe eating a ton of foods loaded with potassium and they become hyperkalemic, we can get the potassium out by giving them K-exalate, K for potassium. And then your third subclassification here are your thiazides. And really the two that you need to be able to recognize, hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone. And they, just like the loops, are potassium depleting. Okay. And when it comes to diuretics, that's it. That's what you need to know. That one page with that information is what you need to know. Because if you know that, then you will be able to answer any question, right? So you understand that's, that's the way this goes. If you know about the potassium situation, so here's a question. You have a patient that's on furosemide and they're also on digoxin. What would be your primary concern? Would be monitoring their digoxin serum levels because if their potassium goes down too low with the furosemide, they're at a risk to become toxic with the ditch. That's why understanding content is so important. So those are your diuretics. I am going to move on to the anti-anginal vasodilating meds. And really the big one, nitro. Nitro, nitro, nitro. Nitro is the one. Nitroglycerin, okay? So I include also in the PowerPoint just a little bit of, you know, like a forward to help people understand. If a patient has angina, angina is chest pain, right? And it's because the muscle, the myocardium hurts because it's not getting enough oxygenated blood. Why? Well, either athero or arteriosclerosis could be the cause. And atherosclerosis is that depositing of fat on the walls of the arteries that make the arteries not, um, you know, not as wide as they normally are. The PowerPoint, let me share my screen. There you go. So for people, you know, just think about bacon when you cook it in the pan, take the bacon out, let the grease sit for a while, it gets hard. That's what happens to your arteries when you eat foods that have a lot of saturated fat. And if that buildup inside gets bad enough, it will cut off the flow of oxygenated blood. It's atherosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis is, comes with age often, and it's just a stiffening or a hardening of the arteries. So if they lose their elasticity with age, the blood can't get through as freely as it did before, and then they're not going to have as much blood flow as they need to the myocardium. That causes angina too. So when it comes to meds, nitro, nitro, nitro. Nitro is a nitrate. Okay? It is a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels everywhere, right? From head to toe. As soon as you take a sublingual nitro, it starts to just open all your blood vessels. They relax, okay? Sublingual, under the tongue, buccal, inside of the cheek. Just with sublingual, you know, one tablet under the tongue every five minutes for a maximum of three doses. And if there's no relief from the angina after the first dose, you call 911 because they may be having a heart attack. If their mouth is dry, they need a little sip of water or maybe some ice. Otherwise, that tablet is not going to dissolve under their tongue. If their tongue is tingling, it's working. If they get a headache, that's expected. Nitro, regardless of its form or root, will cause a headache. And it's because the blood flow, just think about it. If you hang upside down, and the blood rushes to your head, make you dizzy, give you a headache. Same thing here, because all the arteries are now dilated and open. The blood just flowing through nice and easy. Blood rushes to the head, they get a headache. No big deal. Take some Tylenol, acetaminophen. They may feel flushing or warmth. These are also expected. They should always change position slowly because of the fact that all the blood vessels are wide open. Blood is just whoosh 
flowing through nice and freely. So their blood pressure is going to come down. You store it in a cool, dark place. You replace that prescription every six months, whether you need it or not. And you can take sublingual nitro prophylactically. In other words, if you have been diagnosed with angina, let's say, let's Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones is diagnosed with angina. Poor old Mrs. Jones, she's 78. And normally she really doesn't have any episodes of it until she starts exerting herself. She vacuums and she feels that angina or she's outside sweeping her, her stoop. She feels that angina. So we can teach her to take one nitro under her tongue somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes before the activity. So this way she may not have any problems with angina while she's doing that because we've opened up those arteries and she's got a nice flow of blood to the myocardium and everywhere else, okay? So that's when we're talking sublingual or buccal. Now, there are lots of other forms of nitro. With the nitro patch, nitro patch is on for eight to 12 hours. It's always off at night. Just remember that it should be off of the patient for at least eight to 10 hours. You want to put the patch on an area with as little hair as possible. You want to make sure that you're rotating the sites so that the skin does not get irritated. Never shave a patient ever, ever, ever. If it's a guy and he's very, very hairy, you can clip the hair with scissors, but you never shave because that increases the risk for infection. Okay. Um, always wear gloves when you're putting on any kind of patch. And it, you should always put your initials, time and date on the patch. So if you're in a facility, we all know, hey, you put this, it was, you know, Susie Q put the patch on today, November 2nd at 8 a.m. this morning. So we all can collectively know when it needs to come off. When you remove any transdermal patch, always fold it into itself to dispose of it. People will dumpster dive to look for these patches, fentanyl especially, so they can slice it open and suck out whatever fentanyl is left. So, okay. Um, nitro paste or ointment. This one we need to talk about. So it's put on this wax paper, looks like a wax paper like applicator, and it comes with the tube of nitro paste and it's measured in increments of inches, like quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch, an inch. And the prescription will be Nitro paste, apply half an inch to anterior chest wall daily. So that's how, when you squeeze it out of the tube onto that wax paper applicator to you know, give them the dose that's ordered. So you use one of those papers per application, you put it on their anterior chest wall and you cover it with a clear occlusive dressing, also known as a tegaderm. Initial date time on that as well, okay? Same principle here. You're going to make sure that you're rotating sites. You don't want to put it on the same spot every day. Rotate the site so that the skin does not get inflamed. And with the ointment paste, you want to make sure that you cleanse the area when you remove the old um, dressing, right? Because that's messy, the paste, the ointment. So it'll be kind of gooey. You want to make sure that you clean, you know, clean that area so that it doesn't irritate the patient's skin, okay? Now remember, with a transdermal patch, all of these side effects apply to all nitro. That headache, and well, not the tingling tongue, but that, that only applies to sublingual or buccal. But the headache, the blood pressure dropping, the flushing, the warm feeling, all of those things happen regardless of the route. The transdermal patch is the slowest route, right? Transdermal anything is slow because it's gotta get absorbed through the skin into the subcutaneous tissue. It, remember, that's not a topical. Transdermal is not topical. It's transdermal through the skin. Topical are ophthalmic eye drops or otic eardrops or other types of ointments like beta methasone ointments, stuff like that, that are for you know like skin rashes and those kinds of things. Those are topicals. Transdermal patches are transdermal and they're slow to act. So if you have a patient that's got a transdermal nitro patch on, they develop angina, yes, they can still take their sublingual, okay? They can still take it because the transdermal is slow and steady, right? Slow and steady. Sometimes 
they have an, uh, an episode of angina that they can still take the sublingual or the bugle, okay? Same applies to the paste or the ointment, okay? So with nitrates, make sure you know they're, they're, they open up the blood vessels, okay? That's how they work. And you know, here are all, I'm gonna put this up. These are all the um, side effects that can happen, the ones that we talked about. Understand something with nitrates. There is a drug that men like, and it's called sildenafil. Anybody know what sildenafil is? If you don't, let me just tell you, sildenafil, I'm gonna pause the share, and I'm gonna just talk. Sildenafil is Viagra. And Viagra is a great little pill to help with erectile dysfunction because almost every cardiac med, antihypertensives, all of them, they give you cardiac problems or, or um, erectile problems. So men will typically not take their medicine because they can't get an erection. You can give them sildenafil with almost any drugs except the nitrates. So if they're on nitro, they can't have Viagra, sildenafil. If they're on isosorbide, that's another one, isosorbide, I-S-O, B-O-R-I-D-E, isosorbide, which is also called Imdor, that's a nitrate drug too, usually in a pill. If they're on that, it's a nitrate, no sildenafil, okay? ATI does like to ask about sildenafil, okay? So can't have it with the nitrates, can't have it with nitro, can't have it with isosorbide. I'm gonna pause the recording for a minute to see if there are any questions. One, all right. So now we're gonna do anticoagulants. Let's get to that. Okay, so anticoagulants. And for the love of God and all that is holy, they're not blood thinners. They are not blood thinners, okay? That's what people call them. They don't thin your blood. They slow the clotting process down. And in this PowerPoint, you know, I wanna make sure that people are familiar with the words. Hemostasis, hemo means blood. Stasis means still, blood's not moving. When blood sits, blood clots. Remember that blood is supposed to be moving 24 seven, okay? And if it's not, it's gonna have a problem. Thrombosis is the formation of a blood clot. A thrombus is a blood clot. An embolus is a thrombus that detaches from somewhere, or it doesn't even have to be from the blood. It could be a fat embolism that comes from orthopedic surgery, but it detaches and it travels through the bloodstream. Where can it go? Well, it can go to your lung and obstruct one of the vessels that feeds your lungs. And that's a pulmonary embolism. If it goes to a vessel in the myocardium, you're gonna have a heart attack, an MI, okay? so. Some people need to have their clotting process slowed down. Why? To prevent things like DVTs. If we know that they're gonna be immobile for a period of time, we don't want them forming a blood clot. So we'll put them prophylactically on an anticoagulant. And people with AFib, AFib is the number one reason that people are on warfarin. Because with AFib, what happens is, the two top chambers of the heart, the atria, randomly and spontaneously will go into this weird, funny dance where they're just jiggling. And while they're jiggling, the blood that's in there ain't getting pumped. It's not moving. And when blood sits, blood clots. So while they're in AFib, that blood is sitting and it could clot. And then, boom, you know, for whatever reason, they convert back to a normal rhythm, starts pumping again, that clot that was in either the right or left atrium now is on the move. And it's gonna go again, brain CVA, heart MI, lungs pulmonary embolism, right? So people with AFib are gonna be on dig and warfarin, dig and warfarin, dig and warfarin, dig and warfarin, always, right? That is the algorithm for AFib. <clears throat> we also use anticoagulants as an adjuvant treatment for myocardial infarction, in other words, if you've already had an MI, right? We are going to have you on an anticoagulant and it might be even like an antiplatelet aggregator like a baby aspirin. But for some people, if they've really developed clots, we may have them on warfarin 
And then, like I said, it's used to prevent formation of blood clots. Um, after valve replacement surgery, that's one that we don't really talk about. If a patient has had a mitral or aortic mm -hmm. valve replacement, they're going to be on an anticoagulant the rest of their life, right? And if it's a, make sure that you're muted, please. And if the patient has a mechanical valve, and this is where I wanna make sure that everybody knows. So they're gonna be on warfarin with a mechanical valve. Mechanical valves last a long time. So if you have a younger patient that say has mitral valve prolapse, they need a new mitral valve, we may give them a mechanical mitral valve, but we need to keep their blood really slow for the clotting. So they're gonna be on warfarin, but their INR will be 2.5 to 3.5. We're, we're gonna keep their INR a little higher just so no blood sticks to the valve and forms the clot. If they get a valve replacement using porcine or bovine valvular tissue, porcine is from a pig, bovine's from a cow, they're gonna be on warfarin, but it's just the regular INR two to three, okay? So, and that's stuff that you need to know. Who would we not give anticoagulants to? Well, if they've had an active bleed or some type of, a disease like a coagulopathy, which, which means they have a problem with clotting to begin with. Tuberculosis and leukemia are problems with the blood also. We're not gonna give them, or we're gonna be very cautious in giving them an anticoagulant, right? Uh, and also uh, women that are breastfeeding, they should not be on um, anticoagulants. And if they are pregnant, they should not be on anticoagulants, okay? Okay. The ones you have to know, these five, warfarin, heparin, anoxaparin, clopidogrel, and aspirin. These, these are the ones that you need to know, okay? And technically, clopidogrel and aspirin are oral antiplatelet aggregators. So they're not true anticoagulants. They slow down your platelets, they prevent them from clumping together. That's what platelet aggregation is. And also know that the Board of Nursing and ATI like to call enoxaparin low molecular weight heparin. So you need to know enoxaparin is low molecular weight heparin. It's given subcutaneously. Heparin is given subcutaneously or IV and warfarin is by mouth, okay? And so, and you also need to know that all of these do not destroy an existing clot. They don't, they prevent the formation of new clots and they'll prevent an existing clot from getting any bigger, but they will not, if you have a clot, anticoagulants don't break the clot up. They just prevent new ones from being formed, okay? And then with warfarin, what do you need to know? You need to know lab tests, PTI and R, okay? So INR is the one they're probably gonna ask you about, 2.0 to 3.0. And vitamin K is the antidote, right? And if they're looking at the PT, PT is measured in seconds. So PT is normally 16 to 26 seconds, okay? If they're on warfarin, because it's one and a half to two times normal, which is 11 to 13, okay? If for some reason they double their medication or they, whatever, their INR, they come in and you check their INR and it's a five, well, you're going to give them vitamin K because that's the antidote, okay? Prevent them from bleeding to death. And foods with vitamin K, they need to be consistent. You never tell the patient, don't eat any foods with vitamin K. You tell them, be consistent. If you're going to eat foods with vitamin K, like kale, spinach, turnip greens, collards, there's a whole list here. Um, you can eat them, but make sure that you're being consistent. So if you like to have a spinach salad twice a week, always have a spinach salad twice a week. Don't have it every day, one week, and then not at all the next, because your I and R will be all over the place and we won't know how to dose you, okay? And with warfarin, this applies pretty much to, you know, like all these meds. Take it at the same time each day, never double dose. Warfarin's slow, takes about a week to get to that 2.0 INR, right? If you are of childbearing age, they're gonna need two forms of birth control because don't get pregnant while you're on warfarin. And with any anticoagulant, 
the patient is advised to wear a medic alert bracelet. And then you're gonna see in here, I put bleeding precautions, which apply to all the meds, right? With warfarin, they can't take aspirin or NSAIDs because they increase the risk of bleeding. And that also applies to all the anticoagulants. And if they're gonna have any kind of procedures done at the dentist or the doctor, they better let them know that they're on an anticoagulant or they're gonna bleed, okay? Then you got heparin. Heparin is given subcutaneously. Antidotes protamine sulfate. The lab test for heparin is PTT or APTT, okay? PTINR, warfarin. PTT, APTT, heparin, okay? So you need to know that. And you need to know that that's in seconds also. So the PTT is 60 to 70 seconds, right? APTT is 35, 25 to 35. Basically, you're gonna get a question where they will say, you have a patient that's on heparin and you're reviewing the lab results and the patient's um, PTT is 148, right? Therapeutic, right? So just try to remember those numbers, right? Remember this too, heparin, heparin works fast. I can give you heparin IV, boom, and you are anti-coag. So what you might see, and this is pretty common, patients in the hospital, we put them on heparin so that they don't develop a clot and we know it's gonna work real fast. We put them on warfarin also and check their blood. When that PTINR becomes therapeutic, in other words, if the INR gets to 2.0, we stop the heparin, send them home on just the warfarin, okay? And then anoxaparin, which is also called Lovenox or low molecular weight heparin, that's given only subcutaneously. That's the most common one that we give prophylactically so that the person does not develop a DVT. If we know a patient's going to be immobile, we're going to give them anoxaparin commonly. Okay. Then we have aspirin and clopidogrel. So a baby aspirin a day, that's used to prevent clots. That is not used because they got a headache. And clopidogrel, Plavix, is also an antiplatelet aggregator that's used you know, to prevent clots. They both have the risk of bleeding attached to them, aspirin and clopidogrel, but it's not the same height of a risk as it is with heparin or anoxaparin or warfarin. They have a higher risk of bleeding, okay? And you also should know that aspirin, clopidogrel, they can increase your serum dig levels and you should never take them with NSAIDs because now you've increased your bleeding risk, right? Pretty straightforward. And when it comes to bleeding precautions, and these apply to all of these meds, right? Anti-coags, anti-platelets. Don't use a razor, no sharp objects. Don't run with scissors, only use an electric shaver. Soft bristle toothbrush so your gums don't bleed. Always have the patient check their urine and stools for blood. Blood in the urine is hematuria. Hidden blood in the stool is melana, black tarry stool, melana. That's a bleed. Make sure that you teach them about unexplained black and blue marks, which are called ecchymoses, right? Or petechiae, which are little red, like pick marks on the skin. Both of those things are signs of bleeding. So if they're getting black and blue marks all over their arms, but they're not banging into anything, that's a problem. If they vomit and it looks like coffee grounds, coffee ground emesis, that's an upper GI bleed. And make sure that there are safe fall precautions, no throw rugs, make sure they have grab bars, good lighting, no extension cords. Because if your patient is on an anticoagulant and they fall and they hit their head, they can have a subdural or arachnoid hemorrhage. They can bleed in their brain and die. And I've seen that happen. It's a sad thing, okay? So you wanna make sure they do not fall, okay? And herbals, they cannot have garlic, fever, few, ginkgo, biloba, ginseng, and fish oil. They're the big ones. They all increase the risk for bleeding, okay? All of them increase the risk for bleeding. When it comes to drugs that, um, can stop a clot, dissolve a clot. Those are thrombolytics, right? You may hear someone talk about something called TPA or streptokinase. You probably will not get asked about 
these drugs. I threw the info in there as an FYI, but they are very specific as to when they can be used and they're, they're kind of dangerous. So, you know, if a patient comes in and we suspect that the patient has had a stroke, they're having stroke symptoms, we're gonna, and if they come in within four hours of the start of the symptoms, that's the magic number, okay? And they usually don't come in that quickly. But if they do, we do an MRI or CAT scan and we find a clot, we can give them a clot buster. And we can give them a clot buster that'll break up that clot now and they won't have any deficits. They won't have had the stroke, which is pretty amazing. But here's the problem. When people get these subtle symptoms of a stroke, like that facial droop or slurred speech, they go, ah, you know what? Let me go to bed. Maybe it'll pass. And they don't come to the hospital until usually a day later when symptoms aren't getting better, they're getting worse. And it's like, well, we missed it. So that's really important to know with those clot busters. Okay. I am going to pause the recording. Okay. Let's do anti hypertensive meds. Okay. And so hypertensive meds, what is blood pressure? How much force it's taking, you know, how, that, how much we're beating up the artery walls, right? Hypertension is the silent killer. You must remember that because the patient doesn't have symptoms. When they start having symptoms like, oh, I got a nosebleed or I'm getting this headache or blurred vision, too late. They're in danger. Because when they start having symptoms, that means the pressure has been so high, so long, that now they're on the verge of probably a stroke, okay? That's why it's called the silent killer. Got two kinds of blood, blood, high blood pressure, primary and secondary. Primary means your blood pressure is high, and I don't know why. Uh -huh. Idiopathic. Some people just have high blood pressure. African Americans genetically are prone to hypertension, okay? It's part of the genetics. Then you have secondary. Secondary hypertension means that something else is making the blood pressure high. Like you can have hypertension secondary to renal disease. If the renal disease wasn't there, like if your kidneys weren't screwed up, you wouldn't have the bad blood pressure, right? So primary or secondary, okay? I did put blood pressure ranges in this PowerPoint. I don't expect anyone to memorize them, but I want you to know that when we talk about normal, and I hate the word normal, right? Hate it. Normal blood pressure, 90 over 50, people go, oh, that's low. My whole life, that was my blood pressure. A blood pressure that's 90 over 50, 100 over 60, yes, it's on the low side, but is the patient symptomatic or do they feel fine and look fine? And hypertension, usually what we're looking at is for systolic blood pressure, anything greater than 140. And for diastolic pressure, around 70 is good. When you start climbing closer to 80, it doesn't take much for you to be in trouble. So 140 over 70 on the high end, 90 over 50 on the low end, as long as they're not symptomatic, okay? And of course, with, with blood pressure problems that are primary, if the patient's overweight, stressed out, if they can just change their life, Eliana, change my life. If they can change their life, sometimes they can bring their blood pressure down without medications. But, you know, it doesn't always work. If they're overweight, they should lose weight. They should find ways to reduce stress. You need aerobic, which is cardiovascular exercise, bicycling, swimming, running, jogging. Don't smoke, except me. If you're going to consume alcohol, which has no nutritional value, but if you are, moderation and decrease the salt because salt's the devil. Salt's the devil. Salt is the devil, okay? There are other meds that are used for hypertension, but that's not their primary, right? Calcium channel blockers, diuretics, we use them to treat hypertension, but they're not the go-to meds except for hydrochlorothiazide sometimes. So this chapter covers your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, and your beta blockers, okay? Understand that the A's, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists, those A's, those three A's, they are true antihypertensives. That's what they do. They lower your blood pressure, okay? 
ACE inhibitors are the pros, lisinopril, captopril, enalapril, and they all are potassium sparing, and they all can cause a dry cough, and you should never use them with NSAIDs, okay, because it can, it can alter the effect of the pril. That's what you need to know about the prills. Dry cough, hyperkalemia, don't take NSAIDs with them. The ARBs, angiotensin II receptor blockers, are the sartans, low sartan, valsartan. They also cause hyperkalemia and they also can affect renal function, okay? That's all you need to know about them. Aldosterone antagonist, there's one, eplerinone, and that one is also prone to causing hyperkalemia. But that one can cause hypercholesterolemia, can raise your cholesterol, can raise your lipid levels, and it can elevate your liver enzymes and uric acid. That's what you need to know about those three classifications of meds, right? Period. Then you have your beta blockers. Your beta blockers are your laugh out loud, your LOLs. The toprolol, atenolol, bisoprolol, propanolol, right? Beta blockers cause bradycardia. Beta blockers affect the heart first. They slow the heart down and they actually decrease contractility of the myocardium where digoxin slows the heart down but increases contractility. Beta blockers slow the heart down first and then they lower the blood pressure. So bradycardia is the most common side effect. They can also cause heart failure. That's the other adverse effect you need to know about beta blockers. So if the patient starts a beta blocker and one or two weeks later, they have symptoms like crackles in their lungs, which is pulmonary edema, or 